presenting the CPR for the Department of Culinary, Critical Care and Sleep Medicine. Good afternoon, everyone. So uh, we are uh, from the Department of Culinary, Critical Care and Sleep Medicine, and we are presenting a case uh, on a relatively newer uh, modality for obtaining mediastinal biopsy. Uh, mediastinal biopsy we are performing using a bronchoscopic approach as a standard now using an endobronchial ultrasound approach. You can have other approaches, but this is a newer uh, advancement in a bronchoscopic field of in obtaining intact mediastinal tissue without a surgical approach. So that would be the highlight of this picture. So the case would be presented by uh, our uh, DM fellow Dr. Ayush followed by Dr. Mirza for the discussion. So we'll move ahead with the case. The patient was a 74 year old male, reformed smoker, diabetic and hypertensive. He was found to have CA larynx in May 2022. A PET CT that was done at that moment of time did not show any evidence of distant metastasis. He underwent surgery followed by post-operative radiotherapy for the same. A repeat FOL that was done in September showed no evidence of restoral disease. The patient was lost to follow up after that. The patient then presented to our OPD in October 2023 after a year with complaints of dry cough, loss of weight and loss of appetite for two months. There was no history of fever, chest pain, hemoptysis, hoarseness of voice or shortness of breath. His general physical as well as systemic examination were within normal limits. So with this background symptoms, we went ahead with the radiology, a CT neck as well as CT chest. If we look at the lung uh, midastinal window, then we can see evidence of uh, lymph neuropathy in the right lower paratracheal location as well as in the subcranial location, which appeared to be homogeneous and they were enlarged more than one centimeter in size, making them pathological. The parenchymal of the lung window of the was normal and the CT neck only showed evidence of post RT changes. There was no evidence of any mass lesion or soft tissue infiltration. So summarizing the case, our patient presented with mediastinal lymph neuropathy in a treated case of CA larynx with symptoms of cough and loss of appetite for two months. So we kept the differentials of an infective etiology like tuberculosis, metastasis or a tumor related sarcoid like reaction. The next step in management was a sampling of the mediastinal lymph node in order to get a definitive diagnosis. So currently the two approaches that we have to sample mediastinal lymph neuropathy are either a bronchoscopic route or a surgical modality. When we talk about bronchoscopic modalities, it could be two, a conventional TBNA or an endobronchial ultrasound guided TBNA. In a conventional TBNA, what we use is a flexible bronchoscope which is inserted into the airway and the needle is then passed through the bronchoscope into the mediastinum piercing the tracheobronchial tree. This is essentially a blind procedure in which we identify landmarks in the airway and then pierce the needle. There is no visualization of the lymph node real time. As a result, we are only able to sample specific lymph node stations like the right paratracheal and subcranial also only when they are significantly enlarged and the yield is variable. The advancement that was next was the presence of an endobronchial ultrasound. So this is a bronchoscope at the tip of which we have an ultrasound probe. This ultrasound probe when opposed to the tracheal wall will give us an ultrasound images of the lymph node stations adjacent to it. Hence we have a real time visualization of the lymph node and in this real time guidance we then insert a needle into the lymph node and obtain needle aspirate samples. As a result, we are able to sample majority of the mediastinal lymph node stations and also are able to sample even subcentimetric nodes. Usually a 21 to 22 gauge needle is used. The samples that are obtained through this modality are needle aspirate samples and are sent for cytopathology, clot code and cell block. The yield is ranging from 60 to 80 percent depending on the etiology. It is higher when we consider malignant etiologies and are close to 60 percent when we talk about lymphomas or benign disorders. Another route through which the EBIS scope can be inserted is the esophageal route. This is known as USB FNA. So through the esophagus, through the esophageal wall, we are able to sample some stations of the mediastinum, like close to the esophagus, that paraesophageal and the subcranial station. So, so we saw that the yield of EBIS TBNA was 60 to 80 percent, making it the modality of choice. But still, there was scope for improvement. For a long time, a lot of research has been gone in order to improve the further yield of EBIS TBNA. Various researchers have used varying needle sizes ranging from 19 gauge to 25 gauge. They've also used different needle types like Proco needle, Aquai needle, but none of these studies showed any significant difference in the yield. 
a newer modality was presence of an ebus intranodal forceps drive see in which a mini forceps is inserted into the node and then the forceps is closed and a tissue sample that is a biopsy sample is obtained from the node so although the study showed that the yield increased up to 90% there was a higher failure rate in obtaining the sample in some cases the forceps was not being able to close inside the the node hence we are not able to obtain a sample so what do we do in cases where we are not able to obtain a biopsy obtain a tissue diagnosis by the help of ebus tvna that is the ebus area is non diagnostic the options exist are either we repeat a procedure or we can go ahead with an imaging guided fnhr biopsy the problem is ct or ultrasound guidance can only be used to sample lymph nodes present in the anterior compartment of the mediastinum also we'll have to breach the lung making the risk of pneumothorax higher the gold standard that exists is the mediastinoscopy which is essentially a surgical procedure done under ga where an incision is made over the neck and a mediastinoscope is inserted just below the pretracheal fascia in this procedure we can access only certain specific lymph node stations like the paratracheal and subtracheal stations and a complete lymph node dissection can be done and the lymph nodes can be retrieved since it's an invasive procedure it has higher risk of complications like bleeding vascular injuries and nerve injuries so now new modalities are coming up in order to get better yields from mediastinal lymph node sampling one new modality that we are discussing today is endobronchial ultrasound guided transbronchial mediastinal cryobiopsy also known as ebus tbnc so what we do in this procedure is we use a cryo probe so cryo over here we can see so this is a cryo probe that is inserted into a bottle of saline when the cryo probe is activated it freezes the tissue or in this case the saline close to the cryo probe thus obtaining a tissue sample so this cryo probe is inserted into the node the cryo probe is activated we freeze the tissue surrounding the the cryo probe and then we obtain a sample the procedure can be done under moderate to deep sedation or under general anesthesia so this is the setup this is the cryo probe machine we have a cylinder which contains a highly pressurized gas like co2 and the pedal to control the freezing time so in our patient we went ahead with an ebus guided transbronchial mediastinal cryobiopsy so the first it was done under deep sedation so the first step was that we inserted the ebus scope into the tracheal bronchial tree we did a lymph node screening for the patient we identified lymph nodes in the subcranial location and ebus tbna was performed so in this video the ebus scope is inserted we can see the tracheal bronchial tree once we reach the landmark we switch on the ultrasound images we can identify the lymph node and then a needle is passed into the lymph node and two and fro motions are done and a lymph node aspirate is obtained so after the tbn is successfully done next the cryo probe is then inserted through the ebus scope channel this cryo probe is then pushed into the node by the same tract that was created by the tbn needle once we have inserted the cryo probe into the node its position is confirmed on the ultrasound images the cryo probe is activated and freezing done for 5 to 7 seconds so once the freezing is done then the scope along with the probe is withdrawn from the patient and we can see a biopsy sample that is attached to the tip of the cryo probe so i would want you to focus on the smaller image here so over here we can see the needle track that was created by the tbn needle now this cryo probe <coughs> is being inserted through the same track into the node and once it's inserted into the node we can visualize the cryo probe inside the node so once we see this image then we activate the cryo probe and obtain a biopsy sample so the frozen sample is then released from the cryo probe and fixed in formalin we can also make touch inference and also do a rapid on site evaluation the insertion point is then inspected for any evidence of bleeding in our patient we did not have any procedural complications we we'll discuss the pathology that was obtained uh, this is dr pranay from the department of pathology is an sr good afternoon everyone uh, we received this uh, ebus tvnc biopsy showing uh, uh, a well preserved uh, lymphoid tissue uh, with uh, uh, lympho uh, lymphocytes uh, in kind of uh, card and in this uh, 28th image we can see where there is ill formed granulomas in this uh, biopsy
and uh, this was the ibus tbna sample clock core biopsy which we received which showed only blood clot and along with that uh, the aspirate uh, slides also showed uh, only blood no uh, definitive uh, epithelial cells uh, or uh, diagnostic material was there whereas in uh, ibus tbmc we found uh, this well preserved lymphoid tissue in which we gave a diagnosis of granulomatous uh, inflammation thank you So till now we have done four such procedures. In all of our patients, we did not encounter any uh, significant complications, and in all the four patients, we were able to establish a diagnosis using Ibis TBMC. We'll move ahead with the discussion. I'd like to invite Dr. Muniza. So coming on to the discussion of Ibis cardiac transplant and mediastinal coronary. The introduction of ABS TBMA has revolutionized the diagnostic approach for mediastinal diseases, causing a shift from more invasive biopsies to simple, well tolerated, and fast efficient process with a better safety profile. Although ABS TBMA provides an excellent diagnostic aid for metastatic lung cancer, the limited amount of liquid tissue might be inadequate for diagnosis of lymphoma and some benign mediastinal markers. So, in order to understand why a new diagnostic modality was introduced, let us first look into the limitations of ABS TBMA. So, the sensitivity of ABS TBMA in the diagnosis of lymphoma is only 60 to 5 percentage. It has also been reported that the diagnostic aid is better in cases of recurrent lymphoma than in normal disease. In case of transfer disease, the diagnostic aid ranges from 64 to 93 percentage with a full diagnostic aid of 58 percentage. So we can say that there remains significant scope for improvements in mediastinal sampling for better tissue acquisition and in the diagnostic aid. Many modalities have been tried in the past, like the internal biopsy biopsy mentioned earlier, but it is associated with higher treatment fees, higher failure rate in tissue acquisition. So, with the aim of obtaining intact samples with sufficient volume suitable for histopathological analysis, that transfusion surgery introduced a new technique which combines EBIS and Cryonics called EBIS TBMC. So, in 2020, they did an EBIS TBMC in a young male of anti mediastinal man with long diagnosis of EBIS TBMA and with extreme diagnosis of primary mediastinal carinoma. Now, after that, many case reports, case series, and two articles have been published. Within the Seleka of two randomized controlled trials, which studied the diagnostic aid of, of EBS TBMC and EBS TBMA, we can see that the diagnostic aid of EBS TBMC, the overall diagnostic aid is much higher than EBS TBMA, particularly in case of benign pathology and in case of lymphomas. It is also very important to note that. The diagnostic aid of EBS TBMC and TBMA are similar to the of metastatic lymph disease. So, the diagnostic aid is high in case of benign pathology and TBMA. It is also been seen that there is additive diagnostic aid of EBS TBMC over EBS TBMA by 43.7% in patients with non diagnostic EBS TBMA rates. So, coming on to the advantages of obtaining samples of EBS TBMC, here we can get an intact sample or we can sample, sample without any fresh particles. The complications in addition to the general complications of EBS TBMA, also the mediastinal states are high and highly plasmic mediastinal patients are not affected due to the risk of infection, mediastinitis. And bleeding respectively. Coming on to complications, the most frequently reported complication is bleeding from the congestive subject. 33 to 34 bleeding is minimally 32 percent of the cases. Pneumothorax and pneumomediastinal have also been reported. So, in most of our patients, after procedure, we do a double chest laser. Coming on to the challenges, though EPS TBMC can be performed at a moderate observation. There are also technical difficulties while inserting the cryopod through the ABS TBMA patch system, especially in spontaneously bleeding patients. So, we would prefer to perform the procedure at a sterilization. 
keep us together. But again, we want to keep on improving. There is still scope for 10 to 20 percent. So this is one modality, and I think the indications have already been told. Contraindications are more important, which we should know. Right now, the the probably larger lesions, uh, negative lesions earlier, where we want definite histopath, like a lymphoma or something like that. I think that is there. Right now, the probe is uh, annual is a little costly, so we cannot kind of do it. Each and every patient may not be able to afford it. It is a slightly you know longer procedure. GA is required. Ideally, GA is required if one really wants to do it uh, nice. So these are the pros and cons, and I think with time we'll get to know. But again, the bottom line, it is not a replacement for reverse CT. I think that is a clear message. But there are some specific issues. So any, I think, any questions, comments, anything we'll be happy to answer. First of all, congratulations. I think it's a very nice presentation by both the presidents and the people who are there to And as Ramon uh, has mentioned, I think in US and in US, you can sample almost all the regions in this case. And uh, US, like the referendum on biopsy, has actually kind of made the boom for us because earlier we were getting ultrasound guided or CT guided. The field was much better. In the case of the US, we have moved beyond diagnostic biopsy. Now we are doing all fever guided procedures like diagnostic fever filtering and fluid remain clear laxative or large And I think the same thing holds true for fever also that you can do many um, you know, therapeutic procedures. So this is very nice. One thing which has uh, recently come to us is US FNAB. And I think some similar needle might be available to you also. Where the yield has always now has increased from about 80 percent, say for example, diastasis tumor to about 90 percent, and we can provide tissue for biopsy for immune overthrowing. And I must, uh, uh, you know, uh, compliment the Department of Pathology uh, that they are able to give us the diagnosis on very small samples also, uh, which which is very thin for biopsy and cytoskeletal. Uh, can we use it for US uh, guided mm -hmm. Yes, I mean, the only challenge I find is that we are saying the GI is 1.5 millimeters per uh, so, uh, without if it's not sharp, I think. No, so maybe a little bit of a challenge, but one day. <laughs> if you put in a 19 G needle first and use the same thread, I think so, it will be good. So, so there's, I, I, when we reviewed the literature, there's a single case report of an US uh, guided yeah, medicine yeah, trial biopsy. Yeah. So I think, and with US, the possible advantage would be that you have a very good vision, and you can actually, you know, uh, you can localize that point and it can be done. One reason for, you know, a, a delayed initiation from our side, we would say it is like a two-year old description is because we had an older equipment, which did not have a compatibility with a 1.1 probe. So I think now, when, once you get that compatibility, that is there. So uh, I also like uh, as a small input from doc pathology, Dr. Arun now who's been, who's seen these biopsies, that whether you feel that once you get this kind of material, uh, is it uh, you know similar from a pathological perspective, or do you feel it does make a difference in many cases? So basically, the biopsy probe is the
So one comment which was made by Dr. Garg also was the newer biopsy needles which mm -hmm. are there. So that's the acquire or the Francine needle which has three spokes instead of a sandal like a needle spoke. So uh, uh, so we uh, reviewed the literature and uh, uh, in there was a single RCT in pancreatic lesions which showed that it improved yield rate. So uh, in an absence of an RCT in pulmonology, we recently completed an RCT comparing the acquire needle with the standard EVC vein needle but we have not found any difference in the diagnostic yield. So I think that needle comes at a cost of nearly twice the price of a standard ebus in a needle and we wanted to see whether that would lead to an improvement, but I think we've not found it, but I think it depends on the on the setting also. Uh, I think what Mr. is also there, they provide a support for all the general anesthesia services. So just any brief comment on general anesthesia, how does it lead to a duration in procedure? Uh, what are the challenges in given GA? Well, uh, we started in 2012, uh, initially, you know, just giving us quite a little bit of energy. Because we were sitting in the same area, and initially we were listening because the setup is not the proper of the when we started. And the doctor told me, and the system guys were not so uh, good as under the center. So now we have developed confidence in each other with all the pulmonary teams. We have been doing cases in and out, and the views are much better at me. So we have been doing a lot of fevers without anesthesia also. But when they find uh, the patient is not cooperating and they want to do the, the other repeat procedure, they do under anesthesia. And the other procedure, radio bronchoscopy also under anesthesia. And they have also refined our techniques where they have about six, seven patients in a day in their own hospital or bronchoscopy. So it is a good learning for us also. And I'm sure they can really learn also. Any more questions on residents? You have two minutes. So, the point is that we have to set the patient's pediatric anesthesia is something where you should not set it. We have had a case report in the region that we get from that absolutely especially the doctor will take it down to him. So, absolutely should not be set up in the yeah. And I think one more thing would be that, you know, if uh, many people, it is recommended as a single use probe, but the cost is kind of prohibitive, I would say, 40,000 for a single probe. But like Jugard, everybody reuses everything but i think if a reuse is being done it should be done with i don't know uh, with a comp comp and i think you should al also possibly consider an antibiotic profile access also which we don't do in ebus or us procedures as such so i think those are some Yes, so, so what is happening is then EBUS, uh, EBUS PV in a needle is a pretty thin needle which goes to a 2 mm channel. In this case, the probe is 1.1, but if you freeze it longer, it might freeze 5 mm and pull out with a 5 mm. But once we see the hole after we've obtained it, it usually is a kind of a self flap kind of thing which closes, and we don't usually end up with an airway opening which is looking as big as the biopsy site. So I think, and there, with the published data, the uh, impact it has on complications is really not seen. There are not reports of mediastinitis or any significant major bleeding. So I think uh, as we are uh, going through that learning phase, maybe we'll give antibiotic profile access, do an X-ray and follow the follow up. But I think uh, that's enough. Uh, that's thank you very much. I think uh, we'll now move on to the next. Unexpected faculty members and uh, dear residents. 
So uh, today, our, our department is presenting uh, multi multi disciplinary management of a patient with fall uh, trauma due to fall and burns due to frost. Uh, I'll call upon uh, Dr. Manju, who is a senior resident in our department, uh, to uh, carry on the presentation. Thank you, sir, and good afternoon to all. Uh, today we are presenting the case of a 22-year-old mountaineer who went missing while descending in Kyan Free, Mount Annapurna on 17th of April 2023. Uh, two rescue operations were performed initially, but that work failed. And after that, he was found in a 70 meters deep crevasse at Mount Green on uh, 20th of April 2023 at 7 a.m almost 72 hours after his, uh, he went missing. So on the same day, 20th of April, he was shifted to a private hospital in Pokhara, where he received CPR for around 3.5 hours and ROSC was achieved. There he was intubated and was started on Vasu pressures and shifted to another hospital in Nepal at Kathmandu. Uh, there he stayed for 21 days and uh, during that stay, he was detected with acute kidney injury, cold burns, frostbite and sepsis. After that, he was shifted to India via air ambulance and was admitted in Ames, New Delhi on 11th of May 2023. On, uh, at, at the time of admission, he was having acute kidney injury, left upper limb venous thrombosis, bilateral pleural effusion, multiple digits frostbite with gangrene, cold burn wounds, which were infected and he was in sepsis. So on primary survey, the positive findings were he was having bilateral pleural effusion with the minimal free fluid in abdomen and there was a uh, right seventh rib fracture and he was receiving he was on uh, injection safety fine fecoplanin unfractionated heparin for his coagulopathy and pan, uh, pantopressor for gastric ulcers and clonidine and amlodipine for hypertension so as you can see uh, this was his wound images on arrival uh, he was having fourth degree cold burn over his trunk bilaterally that was uh, having foul smell and was salty. And these are his injuries over the upper limb. Uh, third and fourth degree uh, frostbite and cold burn are there. And these are the wound over his uh, bilateral teeth. So on is uh, the issues on admission, as I have mentioned, he was having uh, pleural effusion along with pelvic minimal pelvic ascites. DVT of his uh, left upper limb and for his AK he was on hemodialysis and uh, the problems we faced was uh, multi-organ failure, uh, sepsis and coagulopathy and the large wounds which were infected and the frostbite of periphery. So our plan of action included involvement of the critical care team, nutritional support then uh, through which we aimed to control his infection and to improve his wound. So now I may call here uh, Dr. Rajat, senior resident from critical care team to present their contribution. So on arrival to trauma center ICU, some of the challenges and the patient condition we faced was the patient was stachyostomized and required oxygen support. There was a tracheal bleed uh, along with the, uh, on the uh, near the peritracheostomy wound and uh, patient was tachypneic, patient was tachycardic, chest x-ray showed infiltrates uh, with a total leukocyte count of 21,200, which was suggestive of uh, ventilator-associated pneumonia because he was ventilated in the outside hospital for the last six days. And admission Apache 2 score was 21, and SOFA score was 8, and injury severity score was 9, which was all indicative of uh, very high uh, severity of injury. And uh, patient had acute kidney injury. Admission CRM creatinine into a trauma center ICU was 4.9. And outside hospital, patient had received six sessions of dialysis before shifting. And there were associated electrolyte abnormalities with a sodium of 151 milli equivalents per liter. So along with uh, these challenges, some of the other challenges which we faced was patient uh, had upper limb venous thrombosis, multiple frost bites on uh, limbs, Hypertensive BP records and BP uh, instability, which required multiple medications, stress induced gastric ulcer without any bleed as such. And uh, MRI done on the outside hospital showed multiple uh, bilateral uh, uh, cerebral hemisphere involvement and lacular in, in parts. 
and uh, we sought multi-departmental consultation from cardiology, nephrology, and cardiothoracic and vascular surgery for uh, uh, comprehensive management of the patients. So, uh, some of uh, how we managed for the next 20 days after arrival to the ICU was the uh, patient had acute kidney injury. Uh, patient was producing good amount of urine output. So, with conservative fluid management, we were able to ta tackle the kidney injury. Upper limb DVT required uh, uh, starting of unfractionated heparin. The uh, problem with uh, uh, treating treatment of DVT in this patient was that patient required multiple surgeries. So, if we give Clexane, uh, it is uh, it won't be able to uh, suffice during surgery. And patient also had AK. With the AK, we cannot start uh, enoxaparin in this patient. So we had to start him on unfractionated heparin. So, but that again resulted in complications such as bleeding from the wound and tracheal bleed. So this was a tricky part where we had to intermittently switch off unfractionated heparin and restart once the bleeding stopped. This resulted in uh, anemia due to uh, bleeding from multiple sites, which required multiple transfusions. And again, uh, there was bilateral pleural effusion with respiratory failure. So we had to insert uh, pigtail uh, in the bilateral thorax to drain out the pleural fluid. And uh, it ha he had complicated pleural effusion, re which re again required intrapleural streptokinase. Again, this was tricky again for us because patient was uh, on unfractionated heparin for uh, his upper limb DVT and giving streptokinase in such patients uh, might lead into hemothorax. And uh, patient already had VAP, so we drew multiple cultures to uh, ag aggressively identify the organism. And the stress-induced gas gastric ulcer was luckily uh, not bleeding, so we managed with pantoprazole 40 milligram IV BD. Hypertension was controlled again with amlodipine and uh, clonidine. Uh, cultures yielded uh, multidrug resistant acinobacter baumani, which was treated with uh, minocycline and piperacillin tazobactam. And uh, fosh bite wounds required multiple surgical debridements. And uh, again, we continued with general ICU care, uh, nutritional therapy, primarily enteral nutrition, intense physiotherapy, tracheostomy care, and bed sore prevention. Now I call upon uh, Dr. Sneha to discuss regarding the anesthetic considerations in this patient since he required multiple surgeries. Thank you. I will be discussing the anesthesia management for this patient. We received the patient in burn plastic surgery block from trauma center for further surgical management. Patient had already uh, previously undergone two surgeries under general anesthesia prior admitting to, the, uh, to our block and was planned for debridement and SPS. There was history of uh, cardiopulmonary resuscitation and prolonged ICU stay. So the course in ICU and the complications occurring concerned the anesthesia management significantly. The first surgery planned was uh, under GA. Since it, she, he had wounds on face and extremities, so it involved whole body uh, surgery. So we planned under GA. Our concern was that patient was already tracheostomized with a 7 millimeter tracheostomy tube. So a definitive airway was already secured. Although the patient had bilaterally conducted sounds which were managed with thorough suctioning and nebulization with Lumi. He had history of seven rib fracture and pleural effusion, but by the time patient presented for PAC, both were resolved and healed. The patient had history of CPR and a prolonged ICU stay. At the presently, he was having um, sinus tachycardia in ECG. So we requested for an echo, which showed normal left ventricular systolic function and there were no uh, regional wall motion abnormalities. One of the major concerns was difficult IV access. Patient had no IV access uh, in the extremity, so we had to take right subclavian central venous catheter uh, since he was planned for multiple surgeries. There was history of left upper limb uh, DVT for which he was already on DOAC, liver octaman which we discontinued 72 hours prior to surgery and was taken for surgery once the INR values were acceptable. He had already undergone uh, 
eight cycles of hemodialysis uh, and there was history of AKI in ICU stay. But at the time of PAC, patient was having normal uh, renal function tests with normal urinary output. But we had given uh, fluids intraoperatively meticulously. And patient had uh, multiple uh, trans uh, PRBC transfusion in view of anemia. After a thorough pre-anesthetic checkup and standard monitoring, general anesthesia was conventionally given with a meticulous use of induction agents and neuromuscular blockage. Intraoperative course was uneventful and recovery was spontaneous, smooth and complete. The last surgery was planned under subarachnoid block after assessing the nature uh, of surgery which was minor and involving lower limbs only. And the post-operative course in the immediate post-operative course was uneventful for this patient. Now I would like to call upon Ms. Aparna to uh, discuss with the nutrition part of this. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, ma'am. So nutrition care process is exists as a second most important uh, management in uh, one's injury. So next slide. So to uh, provide uh, tailored made nutrition therapy to Anura, first we have to uh, we had performed uh, nutrition assessment to Anura uh, on on which we found. That he is already uh, uh, falling uh, malnourished category. His weight was 48 on the admission. Uh, and also he is suffering from AKI. So uh, choosing of protein is a big challenge for us. Next. In nutrition care process, we, uh, first we have to uh, know his food habits. Uh, what kind of food he likes. Uh, uh, he is vegetarian, uh, had no food allergies and uh, intolerance. The mode of feeding was oral. Then uh, our pr primary goal is to provide uh, optimum calories because in burn uh, we use Kudari formula in, and after the calculation we get uh, that patient required 20, uh, 2700 calories and 20 grams of protein. That is a very big uh, target to achieve. Uh, and uh, the principle of diet was high calorie, high protein, and patient pulls out so much of fluid uh, from surface area, so he needs uh, additional vitamin and mineral, and also need uh, immunoglobulin in his diet. So these are the nutrition calculation we use Kudari formula. I uh, I just said he required 2700 calories on daily basis, along with 1.7 gram per kg body weight. And carbohydrate, uh, uh, we calculate as 55% of total calories and fat was 25%. Then you can see the list of micronutrients. Uh, patient needs uh, all these uh, micro, micronutrients on daily basis. We also provide him glutamine uh, for the hypermetabolic, uh, to reduce the hypermetabolic response. Sir, sir it is a mineral. <laughs> Three types of mineral, uh, selenium, zinc, and magnesium. In nutrition uh, provision, we, uh, we design this kind of diet. Uh, as you can see, we provide protein in each, each meal. In breakfast, we, uh, as he is vegetarian, we provide him paneer, uh, then uh, glutamine. Uh, in lunch, dal and curd is a source of protein. Then in evening we provide him paneer sandwich, glutamine. In dinner again the dal and curd is a source of protein, and on bed time milk uh, with protein supplement. So these are the points to consider. Uh, optimum nutrition provision from the beginning we should not uh, waste time because in uh, patient uh, when he was uh, in Nepal he already uh, lost eight to ten kg of his weight. So we start uh, early nutrition. In initially days, we provide him RT, uh, enteral nutrition, and uh, formula was 1.5 calorie per ml. Then gradually he, uh, you know, uh, turned on uh, oral diet. Uh, daily nutrition intake is very important. If you if you don't assess your patient regularly, that was previous day what he had. You cannot change in his diet and. Uh, 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 to improve 
So what it is, if patient gets similar diet, he will get bored and his uh, intake will fall down. And that we don't want. And to prevent muscle loss and catabolism, we uh, promote high protein diet. To achieve high protein diet, uh, we need to provide different kind of protein source in, in, in his each meal. Uh, not only I can do wonders, so we have to provide different kind of protein source. So diet will be interesting for, for, for him. And timely management of GI issues are very important. Uh, like uh, in when we provide that much of protein to a patient, he will uh, sometimes uh, not, don't digest it. So we have to uh, add commercial fiber to his diet uh, because fiber uh, played a role in protein absorption. And if patient is having loose motion, uh, then we have to add milk, uh, more milk, uh, sorry, more curd uh, in, in his diet. And last uh, but not the least, I would like to, uh, you know, say that the, on the admission, his weight was 48 kg. And on the discharge, his weight was uh, 56. So that is the achievement for us. Thank you so very much. Please, uh, Dr. Mani, I would like to Yes, sir. Sir, uh, we provide in, uh, glutamine, 0 0.3 grams of AG body weight, 20 grams. We provide glutamine. Thank you. now we have seen the aspects from critical care team anesthesia and nutrition now we will move forward with our surgical plan surgical planning so uh, so initially we have mentioned that uh, he was in sepsis and this wound was one source of his uh, sepsis so the wound was foul smelling and it was grossly infected the patient was on heparin uh, and that was a challenge to us so we planned a conservative surgery for him uh, we initially we did a tangential excision and grid ironing on 13th of May that is on the second day of his arrival under GA for uh, source control. Uh, even after taking the precautions uh, at the I means on the evening we received a call from ICU that the patient was having bleed from the wound site. On examination there was hematoma. We removed all the hematoma and the wound was cleaned and dressed. Uh, by the this is a image after the second surgery by the second surgery uh, again we did an excision grid ironing on 27th of may 2023 by this surgery we were able to control his uh, infection source the fever spikes reduced and the wound improved and he, we were able to shift him to ward from icu so uh, by the third surgery he was stabilized and uh, in third surgery, from third surgery, we have started reconstructive surgeries where we did a debridement along with split thickness skin grafting under general anesthesia on uh, 7th of June 2023. So in this picture, uh, you will be able to see the ESH car which was debrided and a skin graft car was given. In the fourth surgery, the amputation of uh, gangrenous digits were done. The right thumb was amputated through the proximal phalanx, left great toe tip was amputated and the distal phalanx of index finger was also amputated. And in the fifth surgery, again a debridement along with skin grafting was done along with intraoperative physiotherapy which was done in July 27th. And uh, by the sixth surgery, we were uh, his donor sites were safe as he was getting lean. So we have done a bilateral thigh sandwich grafting where, he, uh, where we also used a cadaveric allograft along with his autograft. And this was done in under spinal anesthesia on 22nd of September. So this was, uh, this is an image showing his, uh, when his wounds are healed after these six surgeries over six months, he was able to walk with support. Uh, and these are his extremity wounds. So from here to this, uh, the second image, it was a long journey achieved through thorough planning and execution. So this is a timeline showing uh, his fall in crevice to uh, when he was transported to India. And this is showing his uh, sequential surgeries. So now uh, I would like to call Ms. Isha to give the aspects on rehabilitation. Thank you, Mr. Mangi. 
So I'm representing uh, physical therapy and occupational therapy team of Burns and Plastic Surgery. So for the rehabilitation, uh, basically during the ICU stay, uh, during the ICU stay, uh, the patient, uh, our main role was to maintain his chest condition. For that, we uh, basically parameter which is available in the, in our ICU is for the oral part. So we made the modification for that, so that the parameter was made for the tracheostomy tube. The patient was able to do the with his tracheostomy tube. Then uh, we use a chest vibrator, which is a mechanical ass assistance to remove the secretion. For each lung, 20-20 minutes, the chest vibrator was done. Then the patient was asked to cough or huff so that the secretions are out. Apart from that, we uh, took help from nursing unit so that the uh, secretions can be taken out through suction. Uh, patient was asked to do the breathing exercises. Patient was asked to do the breathing techniques. So that was to be done every two hours. Our second major goal was to prevent the muscle contractures and joint stiffness. For that, a uh, range of motion exercises were performed and the caregiver was, was explained the same. The bed positioning and in bed mobility so that the patient is able to sit up by himself, uh, do side turning to prevent the pressure sores, and do the pelvic bridging. And all these in, mobile, in bed mobilization was explained and was done twice a day. In the later stage rehabilitation, we faced the major uh, challenges with. Patient already had myonecrosis due to cold. There was loss of muscle mass. And ICU, may, patient was there for more than six weeks. Because of that, there was extreme weakness. Patient was not able even to get up and sit to the uh, come to the sitting position. So, uh, progressive strengthening exercises was started for the same. There was hypersensitivity in bilateral hand and feet due to which patient was not able to make, make any grips. उठने के लिए जब हम उसे बेड होल्ड करने के लिए कहते थे तो उस टाइम भी उसको सडनली करंट फील होता था तो ही यूज्ड टू से कि एक्सट्रीम करंट है ही कैन नॉट डू दैट सो दैट वाज द मेजर प्रॉब्लम इन आवर रिहैबिलिटेशन देन देयर वाज लॉस ऑफ थंब फिंगर टिप्स एंड ग्रेटर टो बिकॉज़ ऑफ व्हिच द ऑल द फंक्शनल ग्रिप वाज गॉन देन देयर वाज अ स्कार कॉन्ट्रैक्शन देयर वर मल्टीपल सर्जरीज देयर वाज अ स्किन ग्राफ्टिंग बीइंग डन देयर वाज स्कार कॉन्ट्रैक्शन ईच टाइम वी टेक हिम टू सिटिंग पोजीशन देयर वाज अ टिल्ट जो राइट साइड का अफेक्टेड था वो हमेशा शोल्डर डाउन हो जाता था ड्यू टू विच ही इवन डेवलप सम बैक पेन एज वेल देयर वाज थर्मल इंटॉलरेंस पैर नीचे रखने के लिए कहते थे गरम ठंडा होता था उससे पैर नीचे जमीन पे रखा नहीं जाता था दीस आर ऑल द मेजर चैलेंजेस व्हिच फेस फॉर द मसल वीकनेसेस वी स्टार्टेड द प्रोग्रेसिव एक्सरसाइज फॉर बोथ अपर लिम्स एंड लोअर लिम वी बेसिकली इनिशियली यूज्ड इट्स ओन बॉडी वेट एज अ रेजिस्टेंस एंड ग्रेजुअली रेजिस्टेड एक्सरसाइज लाइक स्टोन ऑन एल्बोस straight leg raises side leg raises then uh, gradually came to the squatting position pani was able to get up then scar uh, there was a scar stretch uh, each scar was stretched the skin was also stretched and individually joint stretches was also given to maintain the mobility of the joint uh, apart from that there was hypersensitivity in bilateral hand and feet for that we have uh, some occupational therapy exercises that is therapeutic exercises and hand equipment this was given The more we touches to different surfaces, the more hypersens uh, hypersensitivity is reduced and new near normal sen sensitivity was achieved. And for the lower limb hypersensitivity, we started the weight bearing exercise, single leg balances, ham curls to improve that. Then uh, functional training, the patient was initially uh, it, uh, it was initially taught the transfers, transfers from uh, bed to wheelchair, then to standing position, then walking, uh, then uh, stair climbing, and gradually to static resisted cycling. There was loss of thumb and fingertips. For that, uh, our occupational therapy actually designed the assistive device with thermoplastic splint. Uh, uh, for the thumb, a splint was made. That splint was given in the initial phase. The patient has bandages, over-the-head bandages, because hypersensitivity, he cannot use it directly. So over the bandages, we use that as thermoplastic splint. It was given and functional training for holding a glass, holding a water bottle, holding a jar. These all trainings were given to the patient. And gradually, since we achieved the spherical grip, but the tripod the pen holding grip was not we were not uh, able to achieve because of thumb loss so for that we made we took a ball and a pen was inserted into it again uh, with that the patient was trained and he was happy to sign again so that was a uh, the patient is still under the uh, rehabilitation process we are uh, to tell consultation is with us next our plan is to make a customized foot with the offloading of the area that has been lost and uh, we are planning for a prosthetic thumb for him and eventually uh, the endurance training so that he can go to running and gradually to his mountain climbing bike so uh, i will call upon dr shubhashi sir for the review of literature thank you so coming to the review of literature 
so this is a unique case because we mostly see thermal burns. Cold burns are uh, very less. So this is a different grade of burns you can see. Now in pathophysiology, uh, what happens is there is micro changes and macro changes. In micro changes there is tissue freezing. There is membrane and protein uh, changes due to low subzero temperature and it leads to vasoconstriction and uh, low blood flow leads to tissue injury. Now management in the acute stage, the management is slow rewarming. That is 30 to 40 degrees centigrade temperature water and you uh, rewarm it uh, for 30 minutes. Along with supportive analgesia, fluid resuscitation. There is some role of hyperbaric uh, therapy, but uh, it is only in the early phase since the patient reached us after one month nearly. So it is not possible to do hyperbaric therapy. Similarly, for tissue plasminogen uh, and heparin, uh, they are initially in the 48 hours, they are very helpful. And uh, in our case, uh, the definitive management that we have to is debridement and amputation of the necrotic finger. Now, this is a elaborative management uh, depending upon the what are the different grades. So, in grade 1 and 2, they are mostly observation. In grade 3, that is, if the patient initially present, then aspirin, aspirin vasodilator can be present. And uh, the bone scan is helpful to know whether, whether the tissue is viable or not. Similarly, in grade 4, uh, they start IV administration of aspirin, vasodilator, uh, as well as antibiotic to prevent further infection. And uh, so now managing frostbite, we usually don't do early surgical debridement or for frostbite, but for cold burn, if the wound is infected, then it is needed to debride it. And uh, so, uh, it is written that six to eight weeks uh, after injury, the frostbite should be uh, debrided to know whether the there is gross demarcation of the viable tissue is there or not. Now, concluding the cold one hypothermia, uh, with hypothermia is challenging because it involves multi-organ system, and uh, the initial management requires critical care support, nutrition, and infection control. The Rehabilitation should be started from the day one because most of the joints are stiff and uh, once the patient is stable then we can proceed for the reconstructive surgery and the wound in, uh, excision along with skin grafting helps. Uh, thank you. I think we are delighted to present this case because we thought it is an excellent piece of teamwork and uh, it was a very long stay patient was with us. And, uh, we found all the important factors which can lead to good uh, because he is now walking and he can independently do whatever he used to do. Of course, he has to learn to live again in a little different way, but then he is now back back to his home and with his family. Yeah. Okay. And giving press conferences. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, in the nutrition part, I was a weight gain of about 8 kg. And uh, sir, I had a doubt was how was the transition from the initial dry stage to being done to work with this protein? This is about 2005 to 2005. Was he recalibrated or what is he being with this because the incident was very challenging? See, he was uh, taken to a pathologic studio. So initially, we had to uh, prepare a document that he was there, sir, and we start with the article. Uh, by the three, four days, he was able to orally. Uh, taken by the mouth. Then we do the uh, so noon time in the uh, in the day time we allow to eat orally. Uh, no, no, the process was for three months. The injection was till the last early because we could not remove the precautions because we had to perform the last surgery. So we removed the precautions after three months. RT is not very much time. Then we start gradually eating. Then we remove RT and we start with the organ. He lost around 24 kg every day. He's from 65 he came to 42. 42 then. And now he's 60. So we got 200. But he had good muscle mass because he was a mountaineer and that all, lot of factors work for him, work for him. 